Okay, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. It must be Wednesday. <laughs> All right, uh, Mitch, tell us exactly what we're doing here now and who's, who is making the show possible. Well, first of all, uh, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum is making it possible uh, through funding supplied by the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, of which I'm a part of. All right, okay. And what we're doing here right now is we're learning about the latest and greatest project from Hawaiian Electric. And we've got Jack Shriver, who is responsible for putting all of this together, and you'll be totally fascinated when you see what Jack <laughs> built. You will. Yeah, yeah. I, I no, was. it's awesome. So, yeah. Jack, welcome to the show, Jack. Nice Thank to you have much. you here. Thank you. Um, so, can you tell us... Um, you know, this is a moment in time. It's an award. It's an important project. It's uh, the confirmation of certain principles and arrangements. Uh, we're excited already. Excite us more. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's great to be on, on here, and I appreciate your, appreciate your time and, and uh, attention to this. So, um, yes, the moment in time is that uh, Hawaiian Electric Company was just recently awarded um, a from the um, Association of Edison Illuminating Companies, which is a utility uh, consortium, um, an award for the Schofield Generating Station project, which is a new power plant that we've built. Um, it went into service about just over a year ago in June of 2018. And um, so we're, the company's been recognized for the unique nature and the unique contribution of that power plant to the way utilities do business. So, what exactly is unique about it? Well, the thing that's most unique about it is the business arrangement that brought this plant into, into fruition, the, the way the project was developed. And it is a, it's a public-private partnership between the Department of the Army, and specifically the U.S. Army Garrison Hawaii, and Hawaiian Electric Company. And um, the real, at the core of that, of that arrangement is Army provided Hawaiian Electric Company um, land, just over eight acres of land, uh, on a 35-year lease. And in return, we have provided an energy security guarantee to U.S. Army Garrison Hawaii in that we can provide them power within two hours, of them saying that they, need, they are ready to receive that power in the, in the form of a microgrid under certain circumstances, um, certain emergency circumstances. Okay. Well, that's just... That, that, that begs to be unpacked. There's a lot to unpack. In okay, this unpack it. <laughs> okay, Mitch, so, Mitch you and unpack. So, yeah, okay, so first of all, how big is the plant? I mean, in terms of the power output. Well, it's a 50 megawatt uh, power plant. So um, it consists of six uh, reciprocating engines, big reciprocating engines, okay. which you know, I'll show yeah. you some pictures of later. So they're like diesel. Does it, does it run are, on water? It does not run on water, not, no. Well, in that case, then, why don't we take the water off the table because it doesn't bear any relevance <laughs> to the discussion. All right. Thank you. I run on water. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a 50-megawatt power plant, um, which is powered by six big diesel engines. But when I say diesel, I mean they run on the diesel cycle. Because right? right. this is... We've got this, this is, and everything. They're not like a turbine. Think tech, right? So we yeah. can talk turbine. No, it's not a turbine. It's a reciprocating engine. Um, but as I like to tell people, you know, these are not the diesel engines of yesteryear where, right. you know, you would you know, get in behind like a diesel car and when they stomped on the gas, you'd get this giant cloud of smoke out the back. <laughs> these are, we don't do that anymore. Yeah, no, these are really... Um, and they're quick starting. They are quick starting. And that's, you know, we're trying to transition over time our generating fleet from a, a more base-loaded kind of um, older style power plants to more flexible generation. We call and a big part of that is to be able to start up quickly. Um, these particular engines, we can go from, from cold iron to full power at 50 megawatts in less than six minutes. With this wow, plant. Wow. That's pretty fast. And just as importantly, we can stop the engines in the same kind of time frame. And, and that's um, important because for our other power plants, you know, if, if we don't need them uh, because there's a lot of solar or a lot of wind and we can ramp down those power plants, um, they take a long time to shut down, and then they have to be shut down for a period of time, and then they take a long time to start up. So with that whole time of shutdown and startup, you're burning fuel mm. and, um, you know, not delivering that energy to the grid. You're using it to start up the plant. Mm. With these engines, you, can, you don't need them. You just turn them off, just like your car. This okay. reminds me of the peaking plant Sorry. at Kapolei. Huh? The peaking plant also runs on biofuel. Uh, it's also quick starting, quick stopping. It's also highly efficient, you know, it's um, technologically advanced, uh, and you only use it when you want it. 
it's the same kind of approach. I'm sure the technology here at Schofield is better, um, but the peaking plant was pretty advanced when it was installed. Was it 10 years ago or something? Yeah, it, you're talking about, I think, um, our CIP CT1 project, which went into service in 2009. Mm -hmm. And that project also was operated on 100% biofuel, as this Schofield generating station is. Um, as a matter of fact, when the Schofield generating station went into service, we actually transferred the use of biodiesel from CT1 up to the Schofield generating station. Um, one, because that was part of our arrangement with the commission and, and with the army. Also, um, because all told, you get about twice as many kilowatt hours of energy per gallon of biodiesel at Schofield than you do at, down at the uh, Campbell Industrial Park. Why? Yeah. A lot of it has to do with uh, the efficiency. There's, there's two basic factors to that. The, the main one is the efficiency of the engines themselves. I mean, these are uh, reciprocating engines are the most efficient form of uh, power generation out there, with the exception of some very, very large combined cycle combustion turbines. Um, but the engines themselves are much more efficient than a combustion turbine or a steam turbine. Um, Operated simple cycle, which the CT1 is a simple cycle combustion turbine. So that's the main thing. And the other thing is the startup time is so quick, so you don't um, you don't waste energy, you don't waste the energy and starting and stopping. Yeah. It's you just, sound like a guy who's been in and around this heavy equipment for a long time. Can you tell us how you got involved? <laughs> um, well, I uh, retired from the Navy um, just over seven years ago and was looking for work, and I got lucky and was hired at Hawaii Electric Company, um, actually hired specifically for this project. Um, and I've stuck around ever since. I seem to get rid of me. What happens when it's finished? It is finished. What it happens? is finished. So we've moved on to other projects and you know, we have a lot of other um, um, irons in the fire. Right now we're just doing our final acceptance testing on a 20 megawatt solar farm um, down in the Westlock area. Mm. So we do all different kinds of generation. So you mentioned about the um, public-private partnership, and I, uh, is it okay we spend a little time on this, Mitch? Absolutely. Okay. Go, go for it. Because that's, that's the, the, the special sauce. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's why they got the award. Yeah. You yeah. can't do this sort of thing without a public-private partnership. Yeah. You know, put the land, the technology, uh, you know, the connections together, and then you, get a, right. you have to have a public-private partnership. So how does that work? Were you involved? Did you, were you involved in the making, the negotiation, the, the term sheet for this public-private partnership? Um, yes. Yeah, I was. So by the time I had joined the project, um, we already had an MOU, uh, a Memorandum of Understanding with the Army. Um, the MOU basically said they want Hawaii Electric to build a power plant on their land, and they're willing to provide that land to us in return for some credit for renewable energy and some energy security. Um, and that was about the extent of it. And we said, you know, we want to provide you with this. We took that MOU to the Public Utilities Commission and we went through a very long, you know, in um, detailed regulatory process to get the approval. What were they focusing on? What do they need for, what did the PUC need from you to be comfortable with this? Well, I think that the main thing that the PUC, you know, they're, they're um, as, as the regulators, they're, they want to make sure that we as the utility are providing value to our customers. So that was the, that was pretty much every question was about, that they gave us was about how is this benefit the customers? What is the benefit to the Army? What's the balance of, of benefits to make sure that, that the terms are, are fair and beneficial to, to all of our customers? Mm -hmm. So that, the, the deal that we worked out was all contained in a lease. So we leased this land for 35 years from the Army. And the terms of that lease um, basically say that the Army will provide us the land at no monetary cost, but in lieu of providing them cash for the land, we will provide them in-kind consideration. And that in-kind consideration comes in the form of an energy security guarantee. Once we have built this plant and tested it out, that we will um, maintain its ability to, um, under certain emergency circumstances, carve out a microgrid out of our existing grid that feeds the Army um, uh, Army bases, Schofield, Wheeler, and uh, oh, it's field stations. Oh, okay. Yeah, field uh, provide power directly to those bases from this generating station uh, within two hours of 
Guarantee sounds like it's really an important part of the deal. Huh? It is a very important part of the deal, and that's the Army was able to assign a value to that guarantee, and that value they determined was greater than the value of the land that they were providing us. So that's a win for them. They have a parcel of land that they weren't using, provided it to us, and in return they get the energy security guarantee. The benefit to us was we get a parcel of land that um, we can build a power plant on, which is a little bit challenging to find here in Hawaii. And uh, we got the land for a very low cost, and of course, that savings on the project cost is passed along to our customers. And saves lower rates and the right lower cost for the project, and mm -hmm. therefore lower rates. Yeah. So let me let me unpack it from my own understanding. So they have the land. You take a lease of the land, and you 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 bankroll the and des the design and creation of the plant. You, Correct. You, it's yours. We own it you and operate it. Own it and operate it. And um, then you sell the electricity to Schofield and other Army, Army facilities. But, but do you sell it outside the Army or just to the Army? The power plant serves all Hawaiian Electric customers, just like all the rest of our power plants. Because it's all on the grid. It's normally tied to the grid um, through one of our existing substations. And it's dispatched every day and provides power to your house and my house and you know, this TV station, et cetera, just like the rest of, the rest of our power plants. Only under um, certain emergency circumstances of things like you know enemy attack and you know hurricane and things like that, where we if the army calls on us, then we can carve out this microgrid and provide power to them directly. Um, and we also have the ability, you know, the, the capacity of the plant, 50 megawatts, is greater than the demand that those three army bases uh, normally have. So in the event that Everything's working properly, and we've microgridded the army, and we've, we're providing that power. We then can expand that microgrid in the event that, so let's just say that there was an island-wide outage. Um, we could expand that microgrid to provide power to, for example, the town of Wahiwa, um, and, you know, certain sections of the town, like the hospital and the fire department, to make sure that the emergency services have power. Um, we can also Again, in the case of an island-wide outage, we could provide power from the Schofield Generating Station down to one of our other power plants down at Pearl Harbor and use Schofield to bootstrap and start Wyo Power Plant and therefore basically rebuild the grid. Well, because Wyo Power Plant needs a cold start if it, if it goes down. It has some black start capability, yeah. um, but this would augment that capability. Mm. Well, very interesting. So, but the rates you're charging the Army would be different than the rates you charge to the grid in general, actually, because of the special deal. No, no, they're on their regular payment plan that they were oh, on before. Okay. Um, they don't pay any more or any less for the power than any other customer does. The deal is all about we get the land at no cost, and they get the service of the energy security guarantee. The okay. rates remain the same. <clears throat> so, what, what's the guarantee like? Oh, I love this. What's the guarantee like? Uh, you know, ordinary customers, uh, you know, either residential or commercial don't have a guarantee. But in this case, it's military, and guarantees are important to the military. They have to function in, in all, all oceans, all seas, to use the Navy term. Uh, so um, what is it like? How does it work? So um, the guarantee is that in the event of one of these triggers that's in the lease um, gets activated, then we have to be able to provide power to the Army, the Army service area, which is these three military bases, um, within two hours of them saying that they're ready to receive it. And that's pretty much it. And if we fail to do so, then we start owing them rent because we failed to deliver on the security. But well, you shouldn't guarantee. have a problem with that because it's fast starting anyway, right? We shouldn't have a problem with it. I mean, there's a lot, um, it's not just the power plant that has to work for this delivery of energy, right? The power plant makes electricity. But we also have to um, be able to deliver it to the customer. And that involves, um, so as part of this, in order to be able to execute on this guarantee, we had to make modifications to portions of our grid, install some motor operated switches and some SCADA, you know, mm -hmm. supervisory control and data acquisition. Um, basically, motor operated switches at certain places so that when, when we're called upon to do that, our folks down in system operations and operate those switches, open those switches to create the microgrid. And then we start up the power plant and bring up the 
Army bases. So did the, did the Army have to do an upgrade of their equipment also, or was it just your end of the grid? The Army does have, yes, they do have to do some upgrades um, at their substations on the bases. Yeah, they have to upgrade their um, protection relays. That's at their cost. At their cost, yeah. yeah. Well, so what about, uh, what about uh, permitting? Because this is on federal land, and the authority having jurisdiction is the base commander. Mm -hmm. So what were the challenges? Did you have any challenges with the permitting? Was it easier because you're dealing with the feds? Mm -hmm. Or did the feds still have to follow you know, the other, you know, the, the, the county's laws? How, how did that work? Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, permitting was a, it's a bit of a, I don't want to say gray area, but this is kind of, this was unique, right? Mm -hmm. So it was the first time that a lot of people were considering the kind of um, project and permitting that we okay. needed to accomplish here. So we did a, uh, an environmental impact statement. Right. Uh, actually, the Army performed an environmental impact statement right. as a prerequisite to leasing federal land. Right. Uh, and that's as required by the NEPA, the National Environmental Protection. Right. We, because we were building a power plant, had to do an environmental impact statement under Hawaii state law. Right. So we, the Army did the EIS. We paid, you know, we pitched in for the part of it that was necessary to comply with state law. Right. Okay. So that was part of it. We had to get public utilities uh, commission approval. Sure. We had to get an air permit, um, an emissions permit for the power plant, and uh, so we got that through the State Department of Health and the EPA. In terms of building permits, um, we did that through the U.S. Army Garrison in Hawaii. They right. provided us the permission to excavate the land and, and build you the power plant. You don't need state or county permits for that. It's the preemption. Um, that was a discussion. You know, who would be the authority having jurisdiction, and um, and so it worked out. It worked out really well. Okay. Um, we built the facility to commercial codes. Mm -hmm. uh, we built it to um, city and county codes, uh, all the codes that we're familiar with, which was a great um, part of this partnership is, is working out the details of that permit. Sure. Because it could have been very difficult and it yeah. could have gone smoothly and, and the Army um, really was a good partner to work with. Mm -hmm. So the garrison commander, when you put the, that together, that was Colonel Dawson, right? He was an electrical engineer by his background. Yes, Colonel Dawson was the CO during the actual execution phase. Yeah, okay. uh, before it, the, all the negotiations happened before him, he was kind right. of handed this deal. Right. And then he was the base commander from when we, he was actually there for the groundbreaking. Yeah. And the, um, the dedication ceremony was like his last week in command. Right. So it was like he was there for the whole execution yeah. part. Perfect guy, though. You know, you would think from the construction video that it only took 90 seconds to yeah, build, but right. it was about 18 months. Ago, so can so. we roll the construction video now? Would now be a good time? Um, sure. Just before the break? A, yeah. Do yeah. we have a break? We do have a break. So yeah, here's this construction. This is a time-lapse video about 18 months of construction. There's the civil work starting. You know, we're digging all the foundations and the trenching. You've got two different angles that you're seeing here. Um, we didn't actually move quite that fast, as you can see in the video, but um, there's the foundation being poured, the concrete for the main building. Substations being built on the left. There go the fuel tanks in the background there. And there's, a, there's the main building being erected. And then in a moment here, you'll see the engines being delivered. Uh, just a little blurb. There's the radiators. There go the engines. You kind of, if you blink, you missed them. There they go. Um, Switchgear building, the stacks are being erected in the, in the background there. Now there's the other view. There's, you can see the stacks going up, the radiators right center stage there, and the fire water protection tank off on the right. And there you go. There it is, an it's entire amazing. power plant you know, Once you get seconds. your permit, these projects know, really move. Just, actually, you know, the Army was really uh, surprised. But you know what, it leads to one interesting away. question. The Army has, theoretically, a lot of money. The Army has engineers, right. like Dawson and others. Right? Um, the Army could have done this whole thing and had complete control of it. They wouldn't have had to ask the PUC. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have had to ask uh, you know, any, any planning, uh, permitting organization outside the Army itself. Um, they could have done the whole thing all by themselves. They didn't have to share it either. They didn't need you. Why didn't, why didn't they do that? 
Well, um, a lot of good reasons why they didn't do that. First of all, it's not their mission, right? Their mission is to train and deploy soldiers and national security. It's not really to run power plants. So they didn't really want to do it. Um, secondly, you know, military construction dollars are just as tight as anything else. You know, who knows when they might get diverted to some other project. Um, and, um, you know, from my perspective, the other, the, another really important reason is if they had done it, and they, uh, they would have just operated the plant when they needed it. And basically in an emergency mode only. They don't want to operate it every day. So it, it would only operate. Waste. It would have been a waste. It would have sat idle for mm -hmm. who knows how long. Yeah. And then when the Army needed it, they would turn it on. Mm -hmm. um, and in my experience, when you only operate things when you need them, they don't work when you need them. <laughs> so, yeah, I have the same experience, yeah. don't you, Mitch? Yeah. Yeah. Totally, yeah. So one of the things that the Army was really excited about was the fact that we're going to operate this plant every day. And we have been essentially operating the engines most days since it was placed into commission so that if the Army requires the plant for an emergency tomorrow, they know that it was operated today or yesterday or you know, recently. And there's, they have a much higher degree of assurance that it'll be ready. Well, you know, this is this whole um, affair, and the, of course, the award suggests that you're pushing the frontier here. This is a new kind of project, new, a new arrangement, a uh, new technology, uh, a new way of engaging, uh, interconnecting with the community, all that. So the question is, uh, and you've been through it, with it, through, through its pretty much all its life, um, what have we learned here about the future? Where does this extend into the future? Will we see more of the lessons you've learned? I mean, what, 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 what excites you about the future, given what you've learned? Oh, wow. Uh, I'm really excited about the future. I think that there's, uh, there's so much going on in this, in this space. Um, you know, in order to get to where we need to go for the 100% renewable um, goal or requirement, um, we need more projects like this that get us from our existing technology of generation to the, a mix of technology, a generation technology that will support 100% renewable, which, you know, this is a complementary. Not only is it renewable in and of itself because it's biofueled, but it also enables the integration of more renewable energy because of the flexible nature of the, of the power plant. Right. And um, so that really excites me. Flexibility. Flexibility, yeah. And I think also the fact that um, taking a large campus like an army garrison facility and us saying, hey, we know that you need some backup power. How about we provide it for you, and we can use it every day to serve all of our customers, but when it's an emergency, you can have uh, the share of it that you need. That kind of a business arrangement is, uh, there's, there's a lot of potential to grow mm. that business arrangement with other large campuses around the state. And um, outside the state. Uh, and outside the state. Of course, you know, we're, you know, I'm concerned mostly about our service area, but, uh, but yeah, that's those two elements there are, I think, what get me. All, all, all the great prospects. So um, you should mention we have more videos and photographs to look at, Mitch. Yes, we do. Is now the time? Right. Let's have a look at those big engines arriving, because they're the monsters. Yeah. So. yeah, so this is a video of one of the six engines arriving. Um, as you can see from the big sign on the side there, they're manufactured by a company called Wartzilla, which is a Finnish company of, right. uh, that is of, from Finland. And so these engines were shipped all the way from Finland in Northern Europe um, across a couple of oceans, right. arrived in uh, Kailua Harbor, and then were put on this large uh, special delivery heavy haul vehicle. Yeah, and look at all the wheels on that thing. Yeah, there's 18 axles on there yeah, and right. uh, well, multiple tires per axle and actually um, Two tractors. You can see one pulling, and then there's one back in the back. Oh yeah, pushing. right. He's pushing. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, wow. Heavy so those duty. had to be delivered at night uh, because we had to shut down some roads. We actually had to cross over the H1 and shut down the H1 in both directions for about 20 minutes wow. while this crossed oh, over. Oh, Varsilla, 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 Varsilla. Yeah. Yeah. They they are a really big company. They're state owned in Finland. They were the ones who who built the uh, the ship 
The Luralene, they expanded the, Lur the new Luralene years ago yeah. and put extra steel in the hull. You remember that story? I know. So yeah, then they cool. went bankrupt or something. Oh, no. And, yeah, yeah, no, the ship. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Vartzilla. Vartzilla is a major, major uh, Yeah, they're a the big company. They started off in mm -hmm. ship propulsion engines right. and then uh, realized that there's a big market for that in the core-based power generation. So they are one of the main manufacturers right. of that. What and, else uh, we got? Um, well, we can actually see a picture of the engines themselves. Look yeah, at those. there they are. Six of them, 8.4 megawatts per engine, which translates into 11,200 horsepower per engine. Wow. Um, they run on, they can run on um, three different fuels. Well, they can run on a variety of fuels. We have them permitted to run on three different fuels. Yeah. They're, since, incept, since the plant's been placed in service, they've been running on 100% biodiesel. Um, they can also run on ultra-low sulfur diesel, and they're permitted to run on natural gas, but we don't have access to that fuel. Right. So, um, so is there any thought of running a pipeline with uh, Hawaii gas up there this, as a third, third supply? Because, you know, they run the pipes underground so they don't get blown over in a, in a storm. Yeah, there was some initial thought about bringing in natural gas. Um, the supply of natural gas available on the island is inadequate to run a power plant on. Okay. It's really just for residential and commercial use in terms of the volumes that are brought in. Right, right. Um, you'd, have to, you'd have to import a lot of natural gas. Okay. But in the event, in the future, you know that there's a biogas yeah. um, manufacturer or uh, distiller, but a manufacturer here in the islands, mm -hmm. that could be a, a fuel source that could mm -hmm. run these engines. So, so you're, getting your, you're getting your biofuel from Pacific Biodiesel? That our current contract is from Pacific Biodiesel. And they're, they're the sole source. Uh, they they have sufficient biofuel um, to run this plant. Yes, that is something. Yeah, yeah that's good for them. It is good, good for Hawaii. It's got to be a fair amount of biodiesel. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. It's and and they've been a great you know partner in this and um, provide us with really high quality fuel. And you know when you mentioned sole source, they they are they are our only fuel supply contract at the moment. They do, com they do compete for that contract, so it's not like a sole source award mm -hmm. because they're a local company, but um, they have won that competitive procurement process the last two times that we've done it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so they're doing no, well. They, they also do the airport, I recall. They do. They yep. light the whole airport with biofuel. Yeah. But they pr we provide the fuel through the contract with them to the airport uh, distributed generation mm -hmm. facility there. So let's look at the rest of the pictures. We're not oh, done. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have one question about the waste heat. Do you do any waste heat recovery, like, at, at this time, or is that something you would no, look at? No, we don't. We did consider that, yeah. but the benefit that we would get relative to the cost was we didn't pencil didn't out. Pencil. So um, with reciprocating engines, you get a lot of waste heat from a combustion turbine. Right. Um, from a reciprocating engine, there is, you know, waste heat, but it's not of the quantity and quality that really gets you a lot of bang for your buck. I'm so sure. it work out. Got it? Okay, what do we got left? Uh, probably, yeah, there's the plant up from up above. I think probably most importantly, if you could show that picture that we had queued up for, for my boss there. There he is. Ah, there we go. This the is handsome, the picture of the day. This is what it's all about. That's right, the handsome Alan Oshima <laughs> receiving our award. Um, from the Association of Edison Illuminating Companies. I believe that we were one of four awardees out of, I think, 80 or so wow, uh, really? awards that were considered, yeah. yeah. So that was a real, it was uh, awarded to us in Naples, Florida, a recent right. meeting. Well, congratulations go to you. Yeah. I think it's terrific what you've done here, Thank and you. there's more to come. And it's uh, another chapter, yet another chapter for uh, developing renewables here in Hawaii, and uh, yeah. it's a major step forward, and all, all kinds of promise and prospect going forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and uh, thanks for the for the recognition and the time to to uh, talk about it. It's been yeah. it's been you know a lot of work over the last couple of years, and it's been very successful. You can do us a favor, though. You can send this to your vast network of uh, people on your uh, email lists at Hawaiian Electric, so they can see the show and get sure. it out there. Sure. So that would be really helpful to you guys, and it'd be very helpful for us too. Yeah. So. All right. So, Mitch, what, what are your closing thoughts on this? Uh, where does this take us, and what does it mean in the larger firmament? Well, uh, first of all, it's uh, an, an innovative project. Uh, the uh, I think the partnership between the Army and the uh, 
public uh, private companies is, is the way forward. You know, we're doing that uh, in other areas like in transportation services contracts. Uh, Riley Sato on the Big Island has developed a uh, concept, or not lag, we actually passed legislation to do that. So now instead of piecemealing, for example, building up a fleet of buses, you can go out and order 40 to 50 buses in one shot because the private company is paying for it plus all the infrastructure to supply the fuel and very important, the operation or certainly the maintenance of it. So that's the same kind of a project. And that's yeah. just starting up and that was made in Hawaii. Yeah. That's really unique. So, made in Hawaii. Yeah. So what you did is unique too, made in Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got all these great projects and we have to keep on doing them. We have to keep the public informed about them. Right. We have, have to keep the level of excitement up. Right. So, you know, thanks very much, Mitch Ewan. Uh, and Jack Schreiber, thank you very much for coming down and doing this. And uh, wow, we have to do more. So uh, we'd like to follow up with you in a few months and see how it's doing and, uh, and, 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 and see on your plans for the next one. Sure. I'll just come back and talk in a couple months about our solar farm that we're placing into commission here shortly. So, okay. Thank okay. you. Thank okay. you Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. Thank Gentleman you. and a scholar. <laughs> Aloha. Okay. Aloha. <laughs>